Today, we are going on to a truly fascinating journey, as I take you through the process of building and using a 400-year-old camera. But before we get into crafting this piece of photographic history and creating images like they did centuries ago, let's rewind and start at the beginning. A few weeks ago, I was going through one of my favorite photography books again. Photography, the definitive visual history. And this time, I really didn't get far into the book because I got stuck at like page 17. There is this very interesting chapter about the first cameras and photographic technology that existed 200 years before the actual first photograph was taken. Among these early cameras is of course the camera obscura. And what I found interesting is that the sketch provided to show a very far developed version of said camera, including a lens and even a mirror. This is very much in contrast to what I thought of when thinking of camera obscura, often nothing more than a hole or small aperture used to project an image onto a wall. So I decided to build that exact camera and try it myself. Not really with the intention of creating great pictures, but hopefully learning something along the way. I started the building process by selecting a large format lens. I decided to go for a Schneider Kreuznach with a focal length of 150 mm and a minimum aperture of 5.6. Now obviously a bigger aperture would be better as it would allow more light into the camera. But large format lenses with a low aperture can get very expensive very quickly. And I didn't want to spend that much money. The reason I started with the lens selection is because the size of the camera is very much dependent on the focal length. Let me explain. Focal length measures the distance between the lens and the image plane for objects that are very far from the camera. You might know this as the infinity setting on your lens. This left me with a rough estimate of the size of the camera. The only thing I had left to consider was the mirror I wanted to include in the camera. But that was pretty simple too, because the only thing the mirror does is change the direction of the light. So I just had to make sure that the red line here is the same length as the focal length. After the lens selection, I decided to build a new lens board. This would later allow me more options when it comes to mounting the lens inside of the camera. Like the other parts of the camera, this part was made from one centimeter plywood. After finishing the lens board, I cut out more pieces of the camera. As you can see, I decided to go for a box shape as a base. When I was sure everything had the right size and shape, I decided to cut out the remaining parts. I assembled everything using small nails. This would later allow me to take something apart if I had made a mistake or wanted to change something. But now, let me show you the very rudimentary sliding or focusing mechanism I came up with. Essentially, just two slots for some wooden boards to slide into. And although there's a lot of friction between the three wooden boards, I think for this use case, it's completely fine. Now, at this stage, I was able to try the camera and to my relief, it did work just as expected. The current state is actually very similar to the camera that was used to create the first real photograph. So maybe I will replicate that someday. However, after that, I added the mirror as I talked about earlier and decided to make the whole thing look a bit more pretty. And that's what the camera looks like. So let me take this outside to finally create pictures using this camera. Here I am setting up a tripod to mount the camera. I added a mounting plate at the bottom to make this a lot easier and the whole arrangement a lot sturdier. After mounting the camera, I focused to infinity and tightened the screws so everything is locked in place. Having everything set up, now it's time to take the photograph, or rather, paint it, because that's how you would have used this camera in 1685. To do that, I started by using some tape to secure the piece of paper to the glass. Now, when it comes to paper selection, the thinner the paper, 
the brighter the image, so keep that in mind. Having everything set up, now it's time to take a look at the incredible viewfinder of this camera. Before I do that, if you liked this video so far, maybe consider liking or subscribing. Speaking of the viewfinder, here it is. Using some old jacket as a dark cloth, I'm actually able to see the image rather well. Now, while drawing, a few things came to mind. First of all, I'm very bad at painting, so don't expect too much. But second, and more important, I kind of realized the amount of personal and artistic influence a photographer has on the image. Photography is often understood as a way of capturing reality, but it really is not, and it never was. I mean, it started out as nothing more than some gadgets meant to help you paint better. And even 400 years later, using tools like Photoshop, we aren't that far away from painting. Speaking of painting, I'm done. I painted the whole scene. As I mentioned before, I'm beyond any doubt no painter. But I think I've certainly learned a lot during this project, and I hope you did too. If I ever use this camera again, I'm probably going to use it for architecture photography. I think it's suited way better as a tool to depict harsh angular shapes with a strong sense of perspective rather than naturalistic landscapes. Other than that, I hope that you enjoyed this video and maybe found something interesting or inspiring. As always, I want to encourage you to run wild with this idea. If you have any questions, be sure to ask them in the comments. Until then, see you next week.